Okay, here's everything you need to reflash your ECU. We've covered the basics. We've talked about what software to use for reflashing and tuning your ECU. So in this episode, I'm gonna go step by step. Talk about every single tool you need to safely reflash your ECU. First thing you need is a computer, obviously. You need the state of the art, top of the line, gaming PC, minimum 128 gigs of RAM, Intel Core i9 processor, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Any old PC actually will do. I don't know why I did that. But the OS needs to be Microsoft Windows. You can't use an old Mac. Most of these softwares that you're gonna be playing with aren't gonna be compatible with Mac OS. It also needs to have at least one functioning USB port. Now comes the tricky part. To be able to read and write tune files to your ECU, you need to find a way to connect this computer that we just talked about to this other computer, which is your ECU. First logical step is to look and see what output and input each device has and the ECUs typically have connectors where your car's wiring harness plugs into and some of those wires actually go out to an OBD port which stands for onboard diagnosis port it's a standardized port it was made mandatory in most of North America after 1996 EOBD is the same thing basically as the European version and that was made mandatory in 2001 and onwards and they're all found underneath the dash somewhere. so all you need is a USB to OBD cable right no, no, that's not, it uh, doesn't work that way. They need to be communicating with the right signal. And most importantly, how and where to look for the right signal. There are 16 pins and your PC doesn't know which one's which. You see, this is an OBD2 port. Yes, all cars after 1996 had to have an OBD2 port. Obviously, the physical shape is going to be the same across all cars and they're all going to have 16 pins. It's standardized and so are some of the pins. For example, pin 16 is 12 volt positive power from your battery. Pin two is gonna be your bus positive. Pin 10 is gonna be bus negative. Pin four is gonna be chassis ground. And pin five is gonna be signal ground. Pin six is gonna be can high. Pin 14 is gonna be can low. And then you have pin seven, which is gonna be the K line. And pin 15, is L line. Because these pins are standardized, that's why you can just connect a generic OBD2 reader and figure out why your check engine light is on. Kinda. But all the other pins can be anything. Usually reserved for proprietary. Usually reserved for proprietary. I can't say this word. Usually reserved for proprietary. I can't say proprietary. I can't say this word. Usually reserved for proprietary tuning and diagnostic god damn usually reserved for proprietary tuning and diagnostic devices you know when you take your car to the dealership and they update the firmware that's it that's the one that's that's how they do it and every manufacturer does their own thing so you need an interface that knows what each pin points to to get the right signal from the right place and that it also understands the signals coming from the ECU and can translate it to something that your PC can understand and vice versa. There are commercial versions of these interfaces. They're very expensive like KESS, KTAG, CMD Flash and a bunch made by EVC and they cover a whole bunch of ECUs and manufacturers. So they make sense for like a busy tuning shop with dynos and everything. You, you just wanna tune your own car, which I actually do not recommend. Tuning your car can damage your engine and vehicle and or cause injury or bodily harm to you and or people around you. You are doing this at your own risk. Tuning your car can make your car illegal for road use in most jurisdictions. Whew. You can get the OBD2 cables that are made specifically for your platform, much cheaper. Because it's only for one platform or ECU family, the interfaces are much smaller, so they just integrate it into the cable. Now, unfortunately, sometimes OBD is not even an option. You would have to open up your ECU and connect to little pins and chips on your ECU's motherboard. This is called bench tuning. It is a complete hassle. Usually people just reflash with an already written tune file that they know works. That way they don't have to keep pulling the ECU, opening it up, connect these little wires to these little pads and chips on the motherboard for every little change they need to make. Honestly, bench tuning, a whole other beast I don't want to even get into. Just know that sometimes connecting through the OBD port isn't an option. They might be security protocols that you need to bypass or the data just isn't accessible through the OBD. In those cases, bench tuning is your only option. There are interfaces for that too, like the BDM and the BSL 100 from EVC. They're kind of expensive. I'm sure there are some DIY options as well, 
there you really need to know what you're doing because man good now you're connected to your ecu but if your ecu doesn't get the right voltage when you're in the middle of a reflash <laughs> It's gone, it's gone, baby. So I highly recommend getting a battery charger, not a battery maintainer, not a trickle charger, battery charger. It needs to output at least 20 amps and even better, make sure it has a supply mode. This should keep your voltage consistent while you're messing around with your ECU. If you wanna risk it and you trust your car's battery, hey, it's your own car. Ex Listen, um, the mic, stopped working right uh, at that point. Am I gonna record it again? That's a solid no. Sorry. Expensive, unnecessary, and easily preventable risk. Okay, now, as part of tuning, you're gonna be messing around with the fuel table at some point, for sure. And for that, you need a wideband oxygen sensor or an air fuel ratio meter just to show you what's going on. Yes, your car already has an O2 sensor, but it's going to be a narrow band O2 sensor. It's just gonna tell your ECU whether you're running rich or lean. There's no number, it's just rich or lean. A wideband O2 sensor works the same way, but it's connected to a wideband controller. It converts the signal to a useful number, like AFR or Lambda. That way you can dial in your fuel delivery not only to make the most power without wasting fuel, but to also keep your engine cool and happy. There are portable wideband sensors you can get. Those are the ones you clip onto the end of your exhaust. Not very accurate. And there are permanent ones that you install closer to your headers. I recommend those. Most of these come with a gauge that you monitor, but that's not very useful or practical when you're just trying to tune your car. You can't really keep your eye on the AFR while you're driving. Like it doesn't. The solution is to wire it to either the ECU you're tuning or to a data logger. That way you can do a pull and see what happened with your fuel and when. Make adjustments, boom. Like a good boom. Like not blown engine boom, just, you know, good boom. Next thing you need is a knock detection system if your factory ECU or your engine doesn't have one in place. Not Honestly, I hate to do this to you. The thing is, the mic, it decided to start working again here. So, sorry. Knock detection systems work by getting vibration signals from these knock sensors that are attached to the engine block. Whenever you get knocked, there's this extra vibration that your ECU detects, and then it retards timing, adds fuel, or something to protect the engine. Honestly, it's not a must have, but you kind of need it to really dial in your ignition timing without blowing up your engine. Because whenever you push your ignition timing too far to get more power or you're running too lean, you get knock or detonation. And that's easily the number one cause of blowing engines when tuning. So if your OEM setup doesn't already have knock detection, I recommend you get an aftermarket kit. They basically work the same way, but they have an interface that processes the signals coming from the knock sensors into audio signals, which you can then listen to through headphones. That way you can back off before you send your pistons into orbit. They used to be very expensive, but right now there's some solid options available for not much money. Highly recommend. Now, last thing you're gonna need, and arguably the most important thing, is patience. Take your time and do everything super carefully. One wrong move and your car is gone. I'm not kidding. If you're unsure about something, just don't do it. Don't make the change, don't click the button, don't change the value, don't do things you're not 100% about. When you brick your ECU and your car won't even start, or it does start and you blow your engine, oh, you're gonna regret it so much. Take your time, make sure you understand what you're doing and what the outcome is supposed to be. The room for error is very tight here. I don't wanna scare you, I just wanna make sure you understand what you're getting into. All you need to do is to be patient. Take your time, read everything very carefully, be fully conscious of what you're doing and subscribe to my channel. You see what I did there? By the way, I asked in my last video what cars you guys want to see tuned on this channel. And you guys are all over the map, man. Get it together. Right now, the BMW E46 and a bunch of GM cars are the top contenders. And then you have this guy. What are you talking about, man? 
You okay? So leave me a comment. Let me know what car you want to see reflashed on this channel. And stop saying E46. I don't want an E46. I don't like E46. But that's it for this video. Subscribe if you haven't already. What are you doing? Like the video if you learned something new. Dislike the video if you don't like my haircut. That'll show me. And hopefully by the next video, if you have enough comments to make a decision on what car we're going to tune. Fingers crossed, it's not going to be an E46. But yeah, thanks for watching.